Thank you all. I'm going to kind of improvise. The questions presented to the actual and hypothetical writer are really almost unanswerable. Or when you try to answer them, you find yourself involved with another question. That's part of the trouble of being a writer, which is part of the trouble of being a human being. It's actually part of the trouble of being a society, since the society believes in answers and doesn't like questions. But we'll return to that in a moment. Albert Camus once wrote that the writer should be the voice of the dispossessed, which is true enough as far as it goes. In any case, Camus' statement has always worried me a little bit because I lived in Paris, and not because I knew the man, but because I lived in Paris during the time of the Algerian-French conflict, a kind of civil war. And in a way, Camus' statement, in the light of what was happening in France before, before 1954, when the Algerian conflict began, or erupted, more precisely, always frightened me because it seemed to me that he did not himself equal what he was saying. That is, if it was a responsibility of the writer to speak for the dispossessed, I felt when I was living in France and watching this, that Camus, who had been born in Oran, should certainly have known that the Algerian conflict was much more complex than the French generals or the French press or the French people wanted to believe. And it struck me with great force that Camus who talked about liberty in the case of Europeans and the existentialist right to be wrong could only talk about justice in the case of Algeria, and he should certainly have known that whatever the Algerians were fighting the French for, it was not for yet another installment of French justice. That was not the point. He was unable, and I'm using him as an, perhaps unfairly, as an example, he was unable to see the dispossessed for whom he claimed he had the necessity and the responsibility to speak. It was then that I began to realize something about the sense of reality which unites what we will call the white world, the doctrine of white supremacy, which has the power to intimidate any possible witness for the dispossessed. Now, having said all that, I now go out on my own, and I think that in answer to the question about the writer's relationship to political ideology, it is dangerous and it's unavoidable. First of all, in this country, in this century, but above all in this country, no one really quite knows what a politi political ideology is. And a political ideology is not necessarily a political reality. If one believes the press, if one believes the television sets of America, there is an ideology which, as far as we know, is called communist. That's a catch-all word, the only one I can use, or leftist. And presumably that's political. And presumably it differs entirely from whatever it is that we in the West claim to have or not have. And a writer tries to deal with these terms, which, by the way, are in any case dealing with him. I realized a very long time ago, or somebody pointed out to me in the days when I thought that art was possible for art's sake. Someone pointed out to me that whereas I might not be interested in politics, politics was fascinated by me. <laughs> and there would be no way around that as long as there was breath in my body. When we speak of the right and the left, we are really 
it's, a, it's an echo of a room in Paris around or before the time of the French Revolution when various delegates were seated on the right, in the middle, on the left. And these in time became representatives of uh, various shades of political ideology. The vocabulary which we use to describe the divergences between us come from a moment long ago, a contested moment until today, concerning a revolution which on the basis of the evidence no one in America understands and everyone in England repudiates. <laughs> no, it's true. And, <laughs> and we don't know, in short, what we're talking about. Now, when a writer attempts to deal with this, when I suggest, standing here before you or on the page, that we have not learned anything about anybody, or certainly not about a political ideology, when we have labeled it leftist, guerrilla, right, conservative, this indicates, I think, a little bit of the difficulty one has, a writer has, when trying to deal with political ideologies, which always have to be simplified into slogans. It is a terribly difficult thing to say, but it is the battle between the slogan it is somewhere between the battle, in the battle between the slogan and the writer, that the writer's trouble is compounded because it is not so much that a writer's responsibility is to speak for the dispossessed or to speak for those who cannot speak or any of that kind of removal. The real anguish is that the writer is produced by, comes out of, everybody, the people who produced him, and the people who produced him, produced him because they needed him. They produced him because he is their only witness in terms of language, their only bulwark in terms of language against the anonymity of the state. And the anonymity of the state is created by all of us, you and me, the reason that Plato wanted no poets in his republic is because a writer is by definition a disturber of the peace. He has to be. He has to make you ask yourself, make you realize that you are always asking yourself questions that you don't know how to face. I would like to believe what I am told about Western history or about history too cool, history in short, but I know better. What I want to convey here is not so much that I know better, is that you, all of you, know better. And I know you know better because you produced me. This connects. You see, it's a series of Chinese boxes I've gotten involved in here. <laughs> With the minority writer. And the minority writer is what, precisely? I look at the word and I ask myself. A minority writer, according to the language in which we are trapped for the moment, is presumably, by definition, a writer whose concerns are more or less tangential to the concerns of what we call the mainstream. For in American life, and indeed in Western life, there is mainstream. And you better get into it. <laughs> if you ain't in the mainstream, you are a minority writer, if not a female. I'm not really trying to be sardonic, but I want you to think about the terms, lying beneath, you know, the, the principal lying beneath these terms. For example, it is a real question whether or not the fate of Rabbit in John Updike's trilogy 
really obsesses most of the civilized world. <laughs> really has anything to do with the lives actually led at this hour of the world's history in the real world. It is disastrous, I think, to suppose that most of the world, that world outside, which is not white, and by the way, when I say it is not white, I don't mean it's black. I mean it's very colored. I mean it's something the American imagination and the Western imagination cannot imagine, doesn't dare imagine. But the concerns of what we will put, describe brutally, or note brutally as, the American middle class are not the concerns of the world and cannot be the concerns of the future. What am I saying? It seems to me that part of the question facing the Western world has to do with that peculiar divorce between the artist and the people who produce the artist. A divorce which occurs on every single level, beginning with the difficulty, that the almost sheer impossibility of being a writer at all in a country and a culture so completely mercantile. It is not really a joke. You make a joke of it later. But when you're very young and you, not being entirely a fool, are forced to realize that if you're going to live at all, if you're, going to, if you're not going to go under, if you're not going to betray everything, then you're going to, be, you're going to have to be a writer. I don't think it's something anybody cho chooses. I don't think that um, it is so special a condition as the Western world makes it. But what does happen, and above all in this country, is when you begun to make the first steps in yourself to being reconciled to being a writer, you've also, at the very same moment, the very same gesture, taken upon yourself the necessity of being a maverick. So that people say, when you, when you, you start scribbling, people ask you, when you're young and innocent, you don't know no better than, than how to answer, you know, the, I, the way I answered, for example, was this, you ask me, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. And you all say to me, yeah, but what do you do? Finally, if you get past all that, when people stop saying to you finally get a job, after you say, I have a job. But that's very important. It is compounded, of course, in this country by the realities of sex, color, and the moral choices everyone in the society is forced to make. Somebody wanted to know what was the status of, of an American writer. And the truth about it is that his status is a little lower, it's true, not a joke, than a competent garage mechanic. People do not take it seriously. At least on one level, they don't take it seriously. They don't take it seriously enough to try to act on what they know they know. They don't take it seriously enough to try to, to dare risking their identities, because that is what it comes to. What we think we are controls us far more than who we really are. And that's why, that's why the writer is always, in a way, in such trouble. I'm trying to, follow, I'm, I'm trying to really be honest and follow these questions down, you know. So I'm, I'm um, sort of halfway through. No, I'm not, I'm not joking, really. It is a difficult assignment. Because the next question is, how do you perceive your public? And that's a real question. All of these are real questions, by the way. If I'm joking about them, because I'm a little frightened. More than little. But how do you perceive your public is a very curious question. 
I can't say it's exactly a 20th century question, but it does come, it is one of the results, the language which one is forced to deal with, is one of the results of the Industrial Revolution. I put it that way because before then, at some point before then, the question was nothing, had nothing to do with one's public. It concerned one's, audi one's audience. And one's audience is a very different thing than one's public. An artist, by beginning to work, begins to create his audience. I can't really describe that further than that. There's an audience waiting for him or her, which can only begin to be activated when he or she begins to work. The artist may create an audience which he will feel, an audience which will nourish him, but he may never have a public. A public exists in the time of the artist's time, almost by definition. An audience is in some sense timeless, in the same sense that the artist hopes his work will be timeless. A public reacts to a personality, and God knows we should know that in this country by now. And personalities come and go like fast food. The trick for an artist is to trust his audience and to know that his audience trusts him. And he cannot cheat that invisible one or two or multitudes of people between him, between him, her, and that audience. There is an unspoken bond, an unspoken promise not to betray, to try to tell the truth. And every artist knows that it is impossible to tell the truth. It is a tremendous word, and it shimmers like a butterfly, and it goes like that. It, it comes like that. You can't tell the truth, but you have to trust it. You have to know that you don't know. You have to know that every time you have found an answer to a question, you have really found another question. This is because time is what it is. And the answer for me may not be the answer for my nephew. The answer for a boy born in my time and place will not apply to a boy born in Brazil or for a boy born in China. And that is why one has to, to try to deal with the truth or let the truth deal with you. It is only with that humility that we can have the courage, really, to learn to love each other, which is really if you really want to think about it, and now I'm not speaking so much as a writer perhaps, but, as, but I am a writer, we are supposed to love each other. Now writers are supposed to know that. And that is what makes them so dangerous. I used to watch people when I was very young. I was fascinated by people. And I was fascinated by words. And for reasons I cannot possibly really decipher, it meant to me somehow a way of finding out who I, not so much, but who I was certainly, but where I was first. It was almost like a game. You know, I can still remember some of the uh, things I described, like the 1933 Plymouth, with, which had knee action wheels. Uh, I studied the coils of that, that spring, which uh, gave the car knee action wheels. And I used to draw Plymouth cars, why, I don't know, sailboats make up stories by the deacons and the uh, brothers and sisters in the church, describe them this way and that way, uh, read everything. It was quite indiscriminately, just, I just read. In my circumstances, it voted ill for my future. It was not very likely that a boy like me, um, and given the black-white history of this country, and also as far as I knew, would ever become a writer. But 
I was lucky in my family, really. I was lucky, in short, and luck's not the word I want. It was the only thing I could do. It was perhaps what I've been born to do. This is, all, this is always what really, in some way, in this very rational age, frightens any, anybody, you know, anybody who says that maybe that's what I was born to do, it does run the risk of seeming to be mystical, irresponsible, or one of those people who never read Freud. <laughs> but I can hardly put it any other way. I had a lot to describe. You know, I was, I was in many ways, if you like, poverty-stricken, but I was not poverty-stricken in that way. There was a lot around me to look at, to deal with, to, um, to be terrified of, to learn from. Coming back now to the question of the quote-unquote minority writer, the people I knew, the people I grew up with, the people in the church, the people in the street, the people in jail, the people who committed suicide, the people who turned into junkards, the people who turned into junkies, the people who turned into cops, the people who ended up in the post office, the people who ended up, you know, a um, 14 year old girl with a baby and the father nowhere to be found, the music, the tambourine, the blues, nothing in all of that, nothing in all of that impressed me as being at all minor. It seemed to me then, and I know it now, that what, what was happening all around me, every day, every hour, differed in no way whatever from what Charles Dickens was telling me about his France and England generations before I was born. It didn't seem to me that anything happening around me was different than what Tolstoy was talking about, or Dostoevsky, or Shakespeare. It seemed to me that all this was a part of life, that all this was a part of some universal wonder, some universal challenge, some universal danger. It was much, much later in my life, really, that uh, the question of color began to afflict what my friend Maya Angelou would call my smallest mind. I got into trouble, really, by acting on the assumption that there was no real difference between Raskolnikov and me. <laughs> None at all. I would have split a pawnbroker's head with an ax almost any other Saturday. <laughs> the pawnbroker lived on the corner. <laughs> and everything we owned was there. <laughs> I understood Raskolnikov very well. I understood all of that cast of characters. It was only later that people told me, well, you can't, you know, uh, but he was white and you're black. But they told me too late. <laughs> By the time they told me, <laughs> I was already beyond hope. <laughs> when I was reading Dostoevsky, he reconciled me to, he made me feel precisely this. I'm not the first person to suffer this way. It happened to somebody else. If it happened to somebody else, then I can bear it. If it happened to somebody else, then it's true. If it happened to somebody else, I'm not alone. But it was my country which insisted that what happened to me was very different from what happened to Oliver Twist. It was my country which insisted that I was a minority writer having no connection with the civilized culture, that I, historically and actually, had to settle not so much for second best or second rate, but was supposed to accept 
my master's version of my experience. He knew more about my experience than I did. I was expected to take his version of my experience and write it down and give it back to him, and thus I would enter the mainstream and become, I would still be a minority writer, of course, but at least I would have a civilized point of view. I am not joking. And furthermore, I've been around a while, and I wish I could tell you that the dynamic I have suggested has changed, but it hasn't. Finally, a writer's responsibility is to his time and place, and there's no way around that. One doesn't wish to examine too closely the connection between commerce, art, and morality. Not only art is in danger. Morality is fearfully compromised, and the people are in danger. The what every writer, perhaps, would like to, let us say, activate on the part of his audience, and in these present days, the part of his public, is the daring to act on the question. Because finally, the nation which produces the artists, people which produce the artists, are responsible to two things. They're responsible, first of all, to themselves. They're responsible for the country in which they find themselves, which is, after all, a, a result, and a direct result or the responsibility one takes for it, or the, or the failure to take responsibility for it. It is time in this country to overhaul a great many things, to question everything, in fact. And the hour is late. I am not absolutely certain, you know, that we can afford this apathy. I'm not certain, you know, that we can wait for someone else to do it in the next century. Most of you who sit before me now will be much, much younger in 17 years, which is when the next century begins, than I am now. And I am only 59. And I'll probably be here too. But we're talking about not merely the writer's responsibility, but all our responsibility. We have, first of all, to take upon ourselves the responsibility of making sure there is a next century. It is not a stage joke. We can blow up the world. It seems to me that one has to then re-examine the language, the assumptions, and the morality which has led us to this place. I refuse to believe, I refuse to believe that we cannot do better than that, that we are not better than that. I refuse to believe we are going to let ourselves be manipulated into oblivion by some of the most illiterate people in the history of the world. That is our responsibility. And if we get past this point, and I am certain somehow that we will, then we can, on another day, again pick up the question of what's the use of a writer? That's what the question really means. And perhaps, you know, realize that his calling may be to be the moral custodian of the always evolving human race. Thank you. We enter now the question and response period. I want to ask you one. 
which is that one of the things that has fascinated me about your life and career is that you have, you are a writer and you're also a spokesman. Going back to 20 years ago, this year, 1963, with the publication of The Fire Next Time. And I have been fascinated by and admiring of the ability to, at least from my perception, the spokesman never engorge the writer, as it were. And you've walked a kind of tightrope, it seems to me, between being a writer and being a spokesman. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, well, I can try. Um, it was a tightrope, certainly. It was, it was very frightening, and I cannot really answer the question. I, this is what happened. I came back from Paris to go to Little Rock, but there's more to it than that. I was in Paris um, working on, well, I was working on a book, but I knew that I was coming, I knew that I was coming back here for it was beneath me to stay in Paris. It was beneath me to um, to read about it in the papers. Besides, I have a family here, you know. I didn't come back to be a spokesman. I came back to be a witness. And, you know, at least to know what was happening in Little Rock. And I became a spokesman by accident, really. But it was very frightening. But I learned that I could, first of all, I learned that in those years, the, the people in the Deep South needed someone to carry the news out. And I found out that I could do that. I've been in the magazine world long enough not to be frightened by magazine editors. And when they said to me, it's not for your readers, I could say, hey, you don't mean that, it's not for your advertisers. And furthermore, I lived in France, I lived in England, so I could always say, too, well, you want to publish it after London does it, or before? <laughs> <laughs> I had a certain kind of nuisance value. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> and I was never, in a way, at war with it, you know, the two rows. I was simply frightened about it. Because being on this lecture platform, for example, talking as though I think I know something is one thing, I have to be here for, and had to be there, you know, for, it's a matter of my, it was a kind of responsibility. And it scared me, because the, the effort of being a writer is exactly antithetical to it. You have to sit down by yourself and, and realize you don't know anything. But so far, so good, no? <laughs> <laughs> We have a question over here. Yes, and uh, your view of the writer as oh, moral custodian. I was, I was wondering how you respond, how you would respond to uh, charges of self-righteousness and the conflict between self-righteousness and righteousness by, uh, by criticism, given to us, by, created by criticism, I think. Well, I don't think that morality necessarily has anything to do with being self-righteous. And again, we are in trouble with the language. I'm t when, I talk, when I talk about morality, I'm not talking about any church or any member of Congress. <laughs> I'm, I am talking about what I conceive of as the ultimate necessity of the human being to treat other people as human. That is all I mean by morality. I'm not choosing one church over another. I'm not attempting to blackmail anyone. I hope I'm not self-righteous, but I do think it is the highest duty of a man or a woman to become a moral human being. Question here. Do you make uh, compromises with uh, what you call the world of commerce as opposed to the, your world of art? I make a compromise with the world of commerce every time I pay my rent. <laughs> 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 that answers your question. <laughs> but you don't compromise on what you write about for as opposed to what people might want you to write about? Or well, you can't really do that, really. You know, that's, um, if you do that, you've, um, 
You can't, you can't really do that. I mean, you can try, you know, and you, you know, you can. <laughs> but you can't really do that, no. What is your vision of the world where the writers are the legislators? What is my vision of the world where the writers are the legislators? I don't think, you know, I'm not, I'm not making any grandiose claims for being a writer. I, could, I couldn't run a gas station, you know. <laughs> I think that's a reference to uh, Joyce's quote about writers are the artists of the unacknowledged legislature of the world. It's a grandiose statement, and um, there's a level in which I can see the truth of it. But I certainly kind of live by that. You know, I don't think I would, have to, I would break that down. I certainly cannot, you know, uh, disseminate it. I think it's a romantic view and an inflated view on the role of an artist. I think that an artist teaches you, somebody put it to me, uh, leads you back to reality again. It can make you see, as over the first time, something you've been seeing all your life. And in that sense, you know, an artist is very, very powerful. But he is not really useful in, the, in the, um, at least no statesman thinks he is, in, uh, in the halls of power. You see, a legislator's point of view has got to be public by definition. An artist's point of view is always private. You don't see what I mean, though, do you? Well, I think that the social responsibility of the artist writer is to be the leader of the world. I th no, 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 I, no, no, no. <laughs> no, being a writer is no is is difficult enough. <laughs> no, no. The artist's responsibility is first of all to become an artist. And that is not an isolated endeavor. That does not mean that he has, not, he has no social responsibility. The only way he can execute that responsibility is by learning to do best what he can do best. I cannot give you a blueprint. I'm not a politician. I'm not a legislator. And if I could give you a blueprint, if I had one, I wouldn't give it to you. Because if you don't figure out how to do it yourself, it would not be done. It is you, the people, who have to be the leaders. This is, the, this, is, this is where you miss my point. Yes. I'm really wondering about the battle that the artist has in identifying him or herself as an artist and where that battle should be fought, whether it's with the self or with the society. And um, my question is, do you feel that a writer should be valued over an auto mechanic? Do I feel that a writer should be valued over an auto mechanic? No, that is not exactly what I meant to say. I was talking about, <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. But I was talking about the, um, the presumptions of this so-called classless society. You know? I was talking really, I was suggesting, I was trying to suggest, I was being a little flip. I was trying to suggest really the loneliness of the mechanic and the loneliness of the writer. You know, there's something they're, bo they're both in false positions. That's what I was trying to say. Um, you speak about writers as moral custodians and moralists, and also that they have a social responsibility. Um, and it seems obvious that when you write that you have something that you want to say, that you feel something's right and that something's wrong. Do you feel that through your writing that you've changed anything? No, I don't think I've changed anything. No, not at all. Uh, uh, I wish I could say yes, but no, I, no, I don't I mean, think. By people reading your books, do you think that they're, they've elevated their consciousness in some way or that, they've, that you've achieved something by getting them to read what you have to say? I know what you mean. I know, I know what you're asking me. It's not a question I can easily answer because I, I, you asked me if I think I've changed anything. No, I don't think so. But then on the other hand, I wouldn't know. And I think I'll never know. But if it changes something in you, you know, then that's what it's about. You see what I mean? Well, that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm referring yeah. to. Well, you see, I won't know that, but you have to know that. You have to know that, and I have to trust it. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? To the left. I would like to ask you, in one of your books, I believe you mentioned uh, a statement saying that the world was white, but it will never be white again. I can't recall the book. But what did you mean by that, specifically? Uh, what I meant by that was almost, what I said, that's, I think that's the end of, that's, that's the essay about the Swiss village. That's Stranger in the Village, I think. I'm pretty sure that's right. And I said, I was saying that comparing the village where 
I was in a village where um, they'd never seen a black man before. And they just come and, you know, rub their, rub their hands in my skin to see if it rubbed off and tussle, you know, try to do, do things in my hair, which uh, I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> but I was trying to make a comparison between the village in which I found myself, where they really had never seen a black man before, and the place in which I was, you know, was come, came, the place in which I was born, where they had seen me for 400 years. And I was trying to suggest that the innocence of that village was not possible for, uh, for Americans in any way, whatever. And that the world America was, was facing uh, would never be white again. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering if, could you give us some advice to young artists who are afraid of what they want to be, but are afraid they may not be what they want to be. They cannot become what they want to be. Why don't you join the club? <laughs> <laughs> I am not really joking, and I hope you never change. You see what I mean? <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, how does a novelist or the writer as the moral custodian write about sin using grace without sounding righteous? Well, first of all, I'm not sure when <laughs> I hear your question. I'm not quite sure you can do it. I'm not quite sure I believe or see so clearly the division between grace and sin. I think that may be a more difficult and more private and more mysterious matter than the language would lead us to believe. We're all sacred. We're all doomed, if you see what I mean. I know some ladies, some prostitutes who were in a state of grace. I know some holy people who were in a state of sin put it mildly. <laughs> to the left. Hi. Um, well, you kind of left me with a bit of a problem. You said that uh, people who were your audience, in other words, people who produced you, had two responsibilities. You said that uh, they were responsible for themselves, and you said they were responsible for or they should try some, I guess, be responsible for their country. And I, I don't know what you mean by that. You know, I know that's my problem, you know, but uh, you said that before, but... How what, do you do? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that country? I mean, I can see caring about, I can see as an individual being responsible for my car payments and responsible for my mind, you know, or my heart. I see what you mean. But as an individual being responsible for my country, now, that leaves it open to, uh, you know, some people can be very um, harsh or cruel. I, I mean, uh, you know, a lot yeah, of Hitler was responsible for his country, you know. Hey, what did you say? I said he took an attitude of responsibility Who for did? his country, Hitler. Ah. That was in his mind. Ah. So I'm worried. No, that is not quite, that is not quite what I had in mind. <laughs> no, 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 no. When I said, I was thinking about myself and my own, my own direct antecedents, responsible for one's country. And no, I, I, I suppose that sounds grandiose, but no, one way or another you are in any case, whether you either know it or you don't know it. In the case, in my own case, I was making a claim coming out of my antecedents, uh, speaking as um, the grandson of a slave, which is what I am. And I say responsible for my country because I didn't intend to be driven out of it, because my father's 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 paid for it. And whatever happens in this country affects me. There's no way for me to escape it. Mm -hmm. You know, that is what I mean. And I think that's true for, I think that's in principle true for everybody, you know. And when you say Hitler was responsible for his country, you should turn, turn the coin over and ask yourself where everybody else was. Yeah. You see what I mean? 
Well, I'm saying, I'm, well, all I'm really saying is you cannot sign a separate piece. Do you see what I mean by that? No. I said you cannot sign a separate piece. If I'm in trouble, you are too. Well, it seems that if you say that to me, the first thing I'd think of doing would be going out and joining an organization. Why? And I feel like that's a cop-out. Why? I don't know. Well, who's responsible? You, you, know, are the, the, you are at the moment. Well, all I can be responsible is for what I have the wisdom to... Keep uh, on keeping on. I'm not asking, you know, that's, that's exactly what it, all anyone can do. I'm not asking you to join anything. I know you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying that, you know, being of uh, an average mind, that's what would pop into my head. I should uh, join the nuclear no. freeze or do this or, you know. <laughs> Well, but then the problem is, okay, if, if I join the nuclear freeze and I don't give a damn about what happens to the person next door to me, you know, then what kind of a person am I? And that's the... Well, you seem to be getting the point. Okay, I have this quiz question written down. Um, I've been preoccupied with what it means to be writing and thinking under threat of nuclear annihilation. It was a time when I told myself I was writing, thinking, even living in order to redeem my past, make of my life a work of art, and creatively usher in a future. And I'm having a hard time holding on to this sense of purpose in the face of annihilation of the human race. And I want to know, how do you hold on to your sense of purpose? I find it, I find it hard to answer because it's, I'm much older than you, first of all. So, <laughs> so it's not really, for me, it's not really a question. I could say, you know, and it would be true, that the world which is coming, which, which belongs to you, I believe in that. I believe in you. I don't see how my generation can play it any other way. I think one has to be concerned. I think we are responsible for the world which we are leaving you. You see what I mean? Keep the faith. It's all I can tell you. You have, you have after, you may not know it, but we have the power to do something about it. We cannot pretend. <laughs> we cannot pretend we don't. We cannot, this is, no, this is not the moment to despair. Thank you. <laughs> In the back. I'd like to ask you a question about humility and heroism. It seems as though throughout the course of your lecture and subsequent questions that people have been using the phrase moral custodian an awful lot. And it seems to connote uh, an action of cleaning up, so to speak. But yet it seems to me in the works of yours that I've read and studied that those characters that are heroic or the most noble don't aspire to, to any positions of leadership. They are not. They don't actively or deliberately try to change anything or to clean anything or anybody up. Their nobility, it seems to me, seems to be just in a basic human dignity, whether it's embodied in suffering or generosity or the act of love. And if those are the kinds of people, whether man or woman, any, any type of character that comprise your heroes, how has it affected you as a writer being private and sharing your private thoughts and yet having to be public and maybe not always in the position to exercise or to show, to show those kinds of qualities or be given the chance to show those qualities that your heroes have? It's a very, I, oh, I think I hear your question. When I, say, when I say moral custodian, I was speaking in terms of, I was speaking in terms of a long past and, and a long future. Maybe custodian was not, was not exactly the word I want. I meant in, in the sense of um, steward. Maybe I should have said witness which might have been a clearer word. But I think the word moral threw you off, too. But I do not mean, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not referring to any sect or, or religion or any particular book of the Bible, uh, any of those things. I'm talking about what I conceive of actually and historically then, you know, if I'm speaking as a writer, as the, um, the possibilities, the reality of the human being. The sacredness of the human being is what I'm really talking about, and which it's out of that center, I think, out of one's, what one believes, what one senses, what one in some way knows about human life, about the oneself and about the other, and the ways in which we're all connected. I'm talking about that. 
and every artist in one way or another, you know, I'm speaking as a writer, but I, I, but I, could, be, I could be a composer, is um, every artist, the work of an artist is, is principally and above all to bear witness to that, which is an irreducible truth, and in some way in bearing, by bearing witness allow help all of us to execute our responsibility toward each other and toward something much more than that too. It's all connected. I can't be, I, it's difficult to be clear about it, but you, I hope you see something of what I mean. I, ju I just, to make it perhaps more clear in my mind, so you would say that uh, for that connection to be possible, it has to start on a personal level. Yes, it starts with oneself. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Take one last question. If uh, the artist is supposed to look after us or morally, oh well, what I, what I heard you saying was that if artists are moral custodians, they're somehow privy to information other people don't have, or oh, no, 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 they're no. somehow better. That was the oh, feeling no, no, I got. No, 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 no. I do not mean that at all. I do not mean that at all. I, I said custodian. I, I could have said, as I said, steward. And I said moral. I'm, why, is the in, why is an artist always in trouble? In every society we've ever heard of. It's because, not because he, he, not because he hates the people, and not because he thinks he's better than they are, but because he challenges something in them to do something which they know they can do and don't want to do, are afraid to do because they, it will make them lonely. They will, be, uh, they will be anathema. This is what Ibsen is all about. What is an enemy of the people about, for example? It is not because Ibsen was better than the people in that town who were afraid to declare a plague because they would lose money. What is it all art about? What is Picasso's Guernica about? It's not because he thought he was better than the Spaniards who were being bombed out of existence by uh, the rehearsal of the Third Reich. But in the act of painting Guernica, which he kept with him, which he kept in France, and would not allow to go to Spain until Franco was dead, that is being, that is as close as I can come to what I mean by being a moral custodian. It but does not mean that Picasso thought he was better. It doesn't mean that I think I'm better. It means that, it means that I'm, I have to try to bear witness to what I know you know. If that, were not, if that were not so, then, no, then the writer wouldn't be in trouble. It's not because it I know something different, it's because I know exactly what you know. And you know I know it. You see what I mean. Does it take an artist to do that? That depends on you. <laughs> <laughs>